and welcome to Vantage This Week. On this show, we recap the highlights of the week gone by, the biggest stories, the top developments and the newest trends. This week, the conflict in West Asia took a dangerous turn. Joe Biden has issued orders to target Iranian proxy groups across West Asia. Iran says it doesn't want a war, but it won't run away from one. What does this mean for the two countries? Are the U.S. and Iran going to war? We'll bring you the full story. Meanwhile, the India-U.S. drone deal is back on, is very much on track. In fact, America is moving forward with India's request to purchase 31 MQ-9 Predator drones after overcoming political hurdles. So what was the roadblock and what is the deal all about? We'll tell you. Staying with the U.S., it is the world's richest country, but also the biggest debt holder. America has a debt bomb of $34 trillion. We explain how it threatens the whole world. And speaking of money matters, India's interim budget was presented this week, the last budget before the upcoming general election. We'll bring you the highlights and explain how Elon Musk implanted a computer chip in a human brain. What does it mean for the world? And what does the future hold? All this and more coming up. Let's get started. The conflict in West Asia is taking a dangerous turn. This is no longer a proxy battle. America is making preparations for direct military intervention. The Biden administration has issued orders. In the coming days, US troops will strike a range of Iranian targets in two countries, Syria and Iraq. And Washington admits that this is a dangerous moment. So this is a dangerous moment in the Middle East. We will continue to work to avoid a wider conflict in the region. But we will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our interests, and our people. And we will respond when we choose, where we choose, and how we choose. They know it is dangerous. They know it could lead to a new, bigger war, but America is going ahead anyway. So what is this operation going to be like? The U.S. has not revealed the specifics or the scale and scope of it. All that we know right now is this. They will strike multiple targets over a number of days. And what are these targets? Facilities and personnel linked to Iran. These could be militia forces, groups that are funded, armed and trained by Iran's Revolutionary Guard force. And will the U.S. put any boots on the ground? Well, they already have troops in the region, but it's unlikely that they'll mobilize forces for this operation, at least not immediately. And when do they plan to strike? Reports say a lot depends on the weather. They want clear skies for better visibility to avoid striking civilians. So safe to assume that drones could be deployed for this operation. But why does the U.S. feel the need to conduct an operation like this? To avenge the death of their soldiers. On Sunday, there was an attack. An American outpost was targeted in Jordan. It, was, it is called Tower 22. It's a logistics hub in Jordan, close to the borders with Iraq and Syria. There are about 350 U.S. officers there. On Sunday, they were struck by a drone. Three American soldiers died. Another 34 were wounded. So it was a major strike, and it has put pressure on Joe Biden. He is facing demands to deliver a strong retaliatory response against what they call radical groups backed by Iran. In fact, they're after a specific group. Listen to this. We believe that the, uh, uh, the attack in Jordan was, uh, was uh, planned, resourced, and facilitated by an umbrella group called the Islamic Resistance in Iraq. The Islamic Resistance of Iraq, that's the group the Americans are after. It is an umbrella group covering all Iran-backed militias in Iraq. But they aren't the only ones attacking American troops. Since October last year, U.S. forces have faced multiple attacks in the region. In Syria and Iraq alone, U.S. bases have been targeted 160 times. They're battling what's called the Axis of Resistance. It's a military alliance built by Iran to push back against Americans and Israelis. Now, there's a large network of militia spread out across this region in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza and Yemen. Right now, this entire region is a hotspot. Missiles have been raining here. Since October last year, the U.S. has struck three countries, Yemen, Syria, and Iraq. And how many strikes in all? At least 61. These strikes were supposed to be for deterrence. They wanted Iranian proxies to stop targeting American troops. But the attacks continue, unabated. 
And where is Iran in all of this? Will it be sucked into this war? How much control does Iran have on these proxy groups and can it stop their attacks? So far, the response from Tehran has been measured without alienating these groups. It is distancing itself from their actions. When American troops were attacked in Jordan, Iran was quick to declare that it did not order the strikes. And then again, Tehran reminded Washington that it was not looking for war. The common chapter between you and us is that we know each other. You know that we do not leave any threats unanswered. While we are not looking for war, we are not afraid of war, and we do not run away from it. Now, the war may be coming to them. Tehran issued a warning today. It came from the president himself, Ibrahim Raisi. He said, and I quote, We have said many times that we will not be the initiator of any war. But if a country, a cruel force, wants to bully the Islamic Republic of Iran, we will respond firmly. That is a message to the United States. The attack in Jordan could be a turning point, really. America's political climate is dictating Biden's response. It is an election year for him. The president wants a second term. He cannot afford to appear soft on Iran, which explains the pace and direction of his response. Once U.S. forces fire those missiles, there is no turning back. The situation could spiral quickly. It could lead to an all-out clash between the U.S. and Iran. And speaking of politics dictating strategic responses, India's drone deal with the U.S. is back in the news. The U.S. State Department has given the green light. It is moving forward with India's request to purchase 31 drones, 31 MQ-9 Predator drones. The deal is worth $4 billion. Let's break it down for you. The Indian Navy will get 15 Predator drones. The Army and the Air Force will get eight drones each. These are long-range, high-altitude drones. They perform surveillance and attack roles. And that's not it. India will also get around 400 smart weapons, including Hellfire missiles and guided bombs. It's part of the Predator drone package. The deal is now in its final stages. Only an approval from the U.S. Congress is pending. It should come in the next month, in the month of March. But why are we talking about it tonight? The intent of purchase was made last year during Prime Minister Modi's state visit to the U.S. So the deal should have been in the bag. But it wasn't. Reports say there were hurdles, political hurdles. And the, the deal was put on hold in December. The objection came from Senator Ben Cardin. He's a member of the Democratic Party, President Biden's party. And he put forward a condition. This is about... Khalistanis in America, specifically about, specifically about one man, Gurpatwan Singh Pannu. Apparently, there was an assassination plot against him. And the U.S. says that India was involved. The physical death, we do not feel. Now, this senator and I'm going to wanted this case to be investigated. He said the drone deal should be cleared only after the investigation. Only after a tough message has been sent to India over Khalistan. And remember, Pannu is a designated Khalistani terrorist. He's now a U.S. citizen. He repeatedly threatens to carry, carry out terror attacks across India. He resides in America, and he's been there for almost three decades. The U.S. has accused New Delhi of trying to assassinate him. They claim to have foiled the plot. India has dismissed all accusations, but Senator Cardin is perhaps not con convinced. Hence the demand for an investigation. Now, when we look at bilateral ties between countries, when we look at defense deals or trade deals, here's what we should understand. All policy is affected by domestic politics. No leader wants to upset his or her voters, which is why Western leaders appease Khalistanis. It is dangerous, and we've said a lot about it in the past, but we cannot wish it away. So the best case scenario for India would be this, to work with partners and push them to act against anti-India groups, at the same time to ensure that they do not put a strain on bilateral ties, that they do not derail deals. And in this case, India has achieved that. The drone deal is on track. The U.S. needs it as much as India, if not more. After all, India is the biggest defense importer in the world, and America is the biggest supplier. For years, Washington has tried to break Russia's dominance in India, in the defense market. 
This deal is a step in that direction. And the U.S. won't let political differences over a bona fide terrorist to come in the way. So I will say that generally the U.S. Defense, uh, India Defense Partnership has seen significant growth over the past decade. Um, this is a proposed sale that was announced during Prime Minister Modi's visit last year. Uh, we believe it offers significant potential to further advance strategic uh, technology cooperation with India and military cooperation in the region. The State Department calls it a significant matter. So they'll find a way to make it work. Such defense deals have political oversight. Multiple departments are involved. Several clearances have to be issued. That is the process. And New Delhi is patiently waiting as the wheels churn. Coming to the drone issue, uh, Sudhi and all our friends. See, this particular matter relates to the US side. Uh, they have their internal processes in place and we are respectful of that. India says it respects the internal processes of the U.S., a mature way to acknowledge government dealings. Perhaps there was never a political hurdle, just a small hiccup. Political differences are part and parcel of democracies, but India and the U.S. have more compelling points of convergence. And this deal is proof. What is the world's biggest concern right now? Conflicts, arguably. The wars in Ukraine and West Asia, they're causing a lot of instability. But what if I told you that far from these conflict zones, there's a new crisis emerging? A $34 trillion debt bomb growing bigger by the day and causing global anxiety. This debt bomb belongs to the United States of America, the richest country in the world, also the biggest debt holder in the world. And when it explodes, this bomb will cause global devastation. The warning comes from the boss of America's biggest bank. His name is Jamie Dimon. He's the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. He says U.S. debt endangers global security. And this debt is humongous. As of today, U.S. borrowing stands at 120% of its GDP. By 2035, this number is set to hit 130%, 130% of America's GDP. That is the level of their debt. And this high level of debt is quite dangerous. Let me quote from what Diamond has said. If you look at that 100% debt to GDP by 2035, I think it's going to be 130% and it's a hockey stick. That hockey stick does not start yet, but when it starts markets around the world, there will be a rebellion. What is this hockey stick he's talking about? It's a scenario where high borrowing leads to higher costs, charges to service this debt. And how does it pose a global threat? Again, let me quote. This is about the security of the world. We need a stronger military. We need a stronger America. We need it now. So I put this as a risky thing for all of us. This is risky both for America and its allies and the rest of the world. Many of these allies have bought debt issued by the US government. I'm talking about government bonds. And their exposure is quite high, around $7.6 trillion. That's how much countries around the world have spent. They have bought this debt, $7.6 trillion. And the, vulner the most vulnerable among them are American allies. I have a list, and topping this list is Japan. Japan owes over $1 trillion of, owns rather, over $1 trillion of US government debt. The United Kingdom, around $716 billion. Luxembourg, $371 billion, and Canada, $321 billion. And why have so many countries invested in US government debt? Because they thought it's a solid investment. As Joe Biden himself says, we are able to borrow because we always pay our debt. But is that really a guarantee? What happens when the loans keep piling up and the US is unable to catch up? What happens if the United States defaults? All of these countries will lose money, their economies will be exposed. Some of them are military allies of the, the US. Canada and the UK, for instance, they're members of NATO. Japan is central to US defense strategy in the East. A default by America will leave all of them weaker, and this is the risk that the JP Morgan chief is referring to. The other big risk, of course, of course is to the US itself. Such high levels of debt will hurt American defenses. Untamed debt could lead, lead to a budget squeeze. 
The United States is the world's biggest defense spender. In 2022, it spent over $800 billion on defense. In contrast, the national debt surpassed 100% of the country's GDP, which brings us to the obvious question, how did the U.S. end up with so much debt in the first place? Ironically, one key reason is America's many conflicts. The post-9-11 wars, the United States has spent or sanctioned around $8 trillion on its wars, meaning they've spent $8 trillion on wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and on strengthening America's global security presence, $8 trillion. These wars were financed almost entirely through debt. Since 2001, these loans have ballooned and the interest keeps piling up. I have some estimates from 2020. Experts say the U.S. borrowed some $2 trillion for its global war on terror. By 2030, interest on these loans would spike to $2 trillion. So the U.S. will have to pay $2 trillion in principal and another $2 trillion in interest. So $4 trillion in all. And what happens if this interest keeps, keeps piling on, if they don't pay? By 2050, the interest payment alone would be worth some $6.5 trillion. So America's many wars are burning a hole in the taxpayer's pocket. And yet they haven't tightened their belt. This debt is now the biggest vulnerability of the U.S., not an external enemy, but its own growing pile of debt. And it should worry the world. It was budget day in India today. An interim budget was passed, the last budget before the upcoming general election, which is why it's an interim budget. In an election year, the full budget is not presented because a new government will be formed in a few months and they will bring a new budget. So for now, what we have is a plan for the next two to three months. It basically means that the central government is placing a request to withdraw money to meet expenses for the short term. And yet, it is significant because this budget also sets the tone for what lies ahead. It outlines policy priorities, areas where money will be allocated and schemes that will shape India's growth story. So what does today's budget tell us? What are the focus areas and key takeaways? We've put together 10 highlights for you. Number one is taxation. It's the big talking point in every budget. Everyone wants to know this. How are tax slabs changing? Well, this time, they're not. No change in taxes. Your present income tax slabs remain intact. So if your earning has not changed, you'll continue paying the same amount of tax. Over the last 10 years, the direct tax collections have more than trebled and the return filers swelled 2.4 times. I would like to assure the taxpayers that their contributions have been used wisely for the development of the country and welfare of its people. I appreciate the taxpayers for their continued support. In other words, Thank you for paying your tax, keep paying it. Same with indirect taxes and import duties, no change in slabs. What about savings? We have something to report on this front. The government will withdraw old income tax demands. These are small and petty notices, they will be taken back. And with this move, 10 million taxpayers will get some relief. Highlight number two, the government wants India to become a developed economy by 2047. They're calling this period the Kartavya Kal meaning the time to fulfill your duty or kartavya, and make India a developed economy in the next 23 years. It's an ambitious target to have, considering the many challenges along the way. Listen to this. Geopolitically, global affairs are becoming more complex and challenging with wars and conflicts. Globalization is being redefined with reshoring and French shoring disruption and fragmentation of supply chains and competition for critical minerals and technologies. A new world order is emerging after the COVID pandemic. Highlight number three, the government has specified its focus areas. It is paying attention to four groups, the poor, the women, the youth, and the farmers. Policies are being crafted around these four groups to bring about their upliftment. As our Prime Minister firmly believes, we need to focus on four major castes. They are 
गरीब महिलाएं युवा एंड अन्नदाता देयर नीड्स देयर एस्पिरेशन एंड देयर वेलफेयर आर आर हाइएस्ट प्रायोरिटी एंड दिस वॉज अ रिकरिंग थीम थ्रू आउट द स्पीच highlight number 4 the big achievements transferring benefits directly to people the focus is on cutting distribution loss and here is what the government says it has delivered more than 110 million dollars to farmers over 260 billion dollars in loans and these have been given to 430 million people under the mudra scheme now these are special loans designed to serve small enterprises companies that work at the grassroots levels And like I said, the focus is on direct transfers by the government, eliminating middlemen. This has been mainstreamed. According to the budget, more than four hundred billion dollars have been deposited directly into the bank accounts of beneficiaries. This has put an end or minimized leakages, and led to savings for the government. Seven point eight million vendors have been given credit assistance. women have been allocated houses under a central government scheme 70% of all rural houses went to women so those were the major achievements that the budget talked about highlight number 5 tackling multidimensional poverty now usually we define poverty on the basis of money we measure it on the basis of purchasing power like how much money you earn or spend in a day But that is just one dimension of poverty it doesn't capture the full picture people may feel poor due to a variety of reasons like when they cannot afford basic necessities like electricity food or water when they are forced to pick an inferior school for their child when they cannot afford proper treatment because of costs there are many cases where one medical emergency can financially ruin a whole family these are all different versions of poverty these people may not be poor by the traditional definition but they all experience poverty so for the government is trying to do is this trying to tackle multidimensional poverty through empowerment we believe in empowering the poor the earlier approach of tackling poverty through entitlements had resulted in very modest outcomes when the poor became empowered partners in the development process government's power to assist them also increases manifold not just handouts but empowerment and the government says it is showing results in the last 10 years it is said to have uplifted 250 million people the idea is to reduce poverty in every shape and form number 6 interest free loans for the youth and housing for all listen to this for our tech savvy youth this will be a golden era a corpus of 1 lakh crore rupees will be established with 50 year interest free loan provided the corpus will provide long term financing or refinancing with long tenors and low and or nil i repeat that sentence the corpus will provide long term financing or refinancing with long tenors and low or nil interest rates Highlight number seven: The government wants to make home buying more affordable. A new scheme is being launched soon. It will focus on the middle class. In addition to this, the government says it will build 20 million houses under a central government scheme, and their construction will take five years. At least that is the plan. Highlight number eight: A big push is being made to promote solar energy through rooftop solarization, meaning installing solar panels on rooftops. The plan is to identify 1 crore houses for this. They will be given solar panels and 300 units of free power every month. How does it help? In three ways, it will reduce the load on power grids, it will enable transition to green energy and reduce your electricity bill at the same time. If implemented well, these ideas can be game changers. Highlight number 9, fiscal prudence. The government wants to borrow less and spend more. The fiscal deficit target has been set at 5.1%. How will the government balance the books? How will it get the money that it needs to spend on welfare? They're placing a big bet on disinvestment. And they've set a steep target of around 6 billion dollars for this. This is how they'll make money. 
Highlight number 10, the special focus on women. The finance minister made multiple announcements targeted at women, like on the healthcare front. The government is expanding its universal healthcare scheme. Now women healthcare workers at the grassroots will get health insurance. They want to encourage vaccination. Reports say the government is in talks to reduce costs for cervical cancer vaccines. They're also focusing on the financial well-being of women. There was an announcement to empower local self-help women groups. Their members are known as Lakpati Didis or Prosperous Sisters. They're encouraged to pool their resources and harness their skills to earn a minimum of 100,000 rupees every month. That's one lakh rupees, hence the term Lakpati Didi. The government will allocate more money to such groups from $240,000 to $360,000. Prime Minister Modi spoke after the budget speech today and he called the budget incisive and innovative. This budget has continuity ka confidence. This budget has Bharat ke four युवा गरीब महिला और किसान सभी को एम्पावर करेगा सो दोस वर द की हाइलाइट्स ऑफ द इंटरिम बजट 2024 फ्रॉम टर्बुलेंस इन द एयर टू टर्मोइल ऑन द ग्राउंड देयर वाज पेंडेमोनियम in the Rajya Sabha today. That's India's upper house of parliament. The chaos was over a remark made by a leader of the Congress party, India's main opposition party. Yesterday, like we told you, the union budget was presented in India and this is how the Congress lawmaker reacted. The centre is not allocating the rightful share of GST and direct taxes to South Indian states. There's a sense of injustice faced by the South Indian states. The funds collected from the southern states are being disproportionately redirected to North Indian states. If this pattern persists, we might be compelled to seek the creation of a separate nation. His name is D.K. Suresh. He is a member of parliament from Karnataka in the Lok Sabha or the lower house of parliament. And he is suggesting a breakup of India, a separate nation for the southern states of India. Why? Because he says there's fiscal injustice in the budget that the Modi government has been unfair to the southern states and the allocation of funds and resources was not equitable. Now, D.K. Suresh is not just a, a Congress lawmaker, apart from being the Lok Sabha MP from Bangalore Rural. He also happens to be the brother of D.K. Shivakumar, who is the Deputy Chief Minister of Karnataka, also the State Congress President. When asked to react to his brother backing a division of India, D.K. Shivakumar did what seasoned politicians do when they're cornered. Attempt a balancing act. Mr. Suresh or any other leader, HK party or any other leader, might have spoken that the pain of uh, South India. See, there should be a balance. The entire country is one. You can't only look at the Hindi belt. You have to look at the entire country. So in this budget, there is no equal distribution of financial sector. Though Karnataka has been giving a lot of revenue to the center, and the entire South India, there is no major announcement which has been done. So we all feel that we have been let down. But as a party president, the entire country is one. We are Indians. There is no question. India should be united. The Congress president, though, was more forthcoming. His name is Malikarjun Kharge. This is what he said. If anyone speaks about breaking the country, we will never tolerate it, irrespective of whichever party they belong to. Malikarjun Kharge will himself say that from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, we are one and we will be one. Well, he was trying to douse the flames. Given our painful history of partition, talk of dividing India is callous and insensitive. And with general elections fast approaching, it is political harakiri. The opposition has a serious foot-in-mouth problem and timing has never been their strong suit. In the past, their numerous personal jives at Prime Minister Modi, from Sonia Gandhi to Manishankaraya, have all backfired. So the Congress President's We Are One statement was an attempt to stop the issue from snowballing. But it was already too late. Here's how the government reacted. 
need to address this question of whether this country can be divided even as a wishful no. thinking Honorable by a member members. in the Lok Sabha. This is not an insignificant incident. This is divisive thinking. It is an attack on our country as well as our constitution. It is an attack on India's unity. Meanwhile, D.K. Suresh has had a change of heart. He now says he's a proud Indian. But he's not the first leader to demand a separate nation for southern states. Politicians from neighboring Tamil Nadu have expressed similar sentiments. Before we get into more politics, here's a quick geography primer. The southern part of India has five states. Karnataka, where D.K. Suresh is from, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. There are also union territories, the union territories of Puducherry and Lakshadweep. Now, currently, the BJP is not in power in any of these five states. The BJP has traditionally dominated the Hindu heartland of India, a region closely aligned to its ideological leanings. But under Prime Minister Modi, it has made inroads in South India as well. They were in power in Karnataka until last year. Also, the North-South divide is not just political. Often, it has been said, the South of the Vindhyas embrace rationality and modernity, while the North is subsumed by religious orthodoxy. But this is reductive at best. That's not to say there aren't cultural and religious differences, but India is a myriad stories of its diversity. And that has been our strength, not our weakness. Look at Rahul Gandhi, the de facto head of the Congress party. As we speak, he is on his second Bharat Jodo Yatra. Bharat Jodo meaning uniting India. He says he is on a mission to unite the country. But it seems, forget the public, he can't even convince his own party leaders. Just before elections, talk of dividing India, a country that they want to come to power in, is not a good look. And that is putting it mildly. How do you ensure stability? Through robust institutions, through checks and balances, enforcing regulation and ensuring fair play. In the last 24 hours, we saw one example of that. The RBI's order on Paytm, the RBI is the Reserve Bank of India, it's the country's central bank, and it has delivered a big blow to Paytm. Paytm is a digital payments giant in India. It controls around 13% of the market share in India. But now its business has been crippled. Starting March, digital payments on Paytm will come to a halt. Customers using Paytm wallets won't be able to top them up. Basically, if you see a Paytm QR code anywhere you are, chances are it won't work. Because the RBI has as good as killed it. Now, to be clear, Paytm still has a license to operate in India. But the RBI order has put it under significant constraints. So starting March, Paytm won't be able to process most payments and that poses a problem because Paytm says it caters to 500 million Indians. 500 million Indians, the company has opened 300 million digital wallets and 30 million bank accounts. That's a lot of people and a lot of accounts. Come March, all these accounts will become useless. And this is a strong move by the Reserve Bank of India. It's a sweeping order. But why was it necessary? The RBI says Paytm has not been playing by the rules. According to the bank statement, Paytm was punished, and I'm quoting, for persistent non-compliances and material supervisory concerns. So the issue is non-compliance, not following the rules. And the RBI order does not get into the details, but Paytm has had frequent run-ins with the Reserve Bank of India, and this scrutiny began, began way back in 2018. Fundamentally, it centers around the KYC rules. KYC is know your customer. There are rules on how much you should know your customer and what you can do with that knowledge. Let me explain. Imagine there's a party happening in your neighborhood at a really cool club and you want to go but there's a bodyguard at the door and he won't let you in. Until he sees your photo ID, he wants to know who you are, where you live, and check your photo against your face. If it matches, he'll let you go. A bank works just like this, like this bouncer. Before they open your account, they ask for some papers. 
They're supposed to establish who you are, where you live, and whether you are a real person or not. So when you approach a bank, you're asked to give copies of these papers and to fill a form. This process is called KYC. No bank will open your account or extend any service to you without this. Now, any, any good guard would also respect your privacy. They won't go around the neighborhood telling everyone that you were at that party. They won't click your photos or photos of your ID and share them with the world. They shouldn't. They should not share any information about you without your consent. And this applies to banks too. They must maintain secrecy. They must protect your personal information. The law mandates it. Paytm got a license from the RBI in 2015. And when an RBI license is given to a bank, it has to comply with the KYC rules. But it, but it appears that Paytm was not complying. Or so the RBI believes. Now reports say that the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, was concerned about how Paytm shares this information with its associates. Your information, how is it shared? The company could also be under scrutiny over its investors. One of them is Chinese. One of Paytm investors is Chinese. It's a company called Antfin, an affiliate of the Alibaba Group. As of December last year, Antfin held almost 10% stake in Paytm. And increasingly, Chinese companies have come under the scanner in India. Their investments and their activities are all being scrutinized here in India. Could this ban be related to such scrutiny? Could it be linked to the Chinese investment in Paytm? We do not know for sure. But Paytm has its task cut out. After the RBI's orders, their shares crashed today by 20%. The company says it is taking immediate steps to comply with the RBI's directions and to address its concerns, but the crackdown sends a message to all, especially to other digital payment providers. While they bring a payment revolution in India, they cannot play fast and loose with the rules. Now let's talk about Elon Musk. He put up a post a few hours ago on Twitter, now known as X, and this is what he said. The first human received an implant from Neuralink yesterday and is recovering well. Initial results show promising neuron spike detection. For the uninitiated, here's what it means. Elon Musk has just put a computer chip in a human brain. His startup called Neuralink has started human trials. Musk co-founded Neuralink in 2016. Eight years later, they have their first human test subject. This is a big milestone. It will allow us to see proof of concept. And what is a concept? A brain-computer interface, or BCI, brain-computer interface. The technology will allow people to control machines with their thoughts. Musk had a follow-up post. He says the first product is called telepathy. It will allow you to control your phone or computer just by thinking. And through them, you can control other devices. If it works, it could be a game changer, especially for people with some form of paralysis. They could benefit immensely from a technology like this. Musk says they will be the first recipients. Here's what he wrote, and I'm quoting. Imagine if Stephen Hawking could communicate faster than a speed typist or auctioneer. That is the goal. It's an ambitious dream. But how does the technology work? Let me take you through what we know so far. A computer chip and other electronics will be inserted into the brain. This is the link in Neuralink. It's reportedly about the size of a few coins. The chip will be battery operated. It can be charged wirelessly, so no need to worry about replacing it, which would be hard anyway, because it will be inserted directly into the brain. So replacement would be a problem. And this insertion will happen by a special surgical robot. They will put this chip into your brain. Yes, a robot, not a trained neurosurgeon. This is because of because one part of the link has wires directly hooked up to your brain. It is so intricate, apparently it cannot be done by humans, so you need a robot to do it. These wires or threads monitor your brain activity. They will read your thoughts and pass them onto the chip. The chip will then send a signal to an app on your phone or computer. 
That is how the setup works. It may sound complicated, but it's not exactly revolutionary. The first device like this came out all the way back in 2004. There are other companies that have been doing this, working on the brain-computer interface for years to get your brain to talk directly to a computer and get machines moving. Older devices let people control a robotic limb with their mind. So it has been done before. Then what makes Neuralink special? The sheer volume of brain signals that it wants to capture, that is what's special. The other brain chips that exist are slower. They may not allow for what Elon Musk wants to do. Because helping people without limbs is just the beginning. He eventually wants an advanced brain-computer interface. Imagine driving a smart car with just your thoughts, or playing video games with your mind, or accessing all the information on the internet through your brain. The possibilities are endless. There's a reason Musk is calling this first product telepathy. It sets the tone for what is to come. Eventually, we could reach new heights of human capabilities, humans augmented with machine parts that are mind-controlled, like a cyborg in a sci-fi movie. But of course, there are drawbacks and threats too. Like almost every new technology, this too will be open to abuse. Imagine someone hacking your brain chip reading your thoughts, controlling your robotic limbs. It's a terrifying prospect. And someone will likely manage to do it, so we need to be cautious. Guard against the potential risks while exploring the potential benefits. Such brain chips may help millions of people, and Elon Musk's company has taken a crucial step towards this. Now we wait and watch. We see how the human test subject reacts to the Neuralink chip. The next few weeks will tell us how far along the technology is and how long until you get such a chip in stores near you. There is a business philosophy. It says that the best financial bargain is a CEO, the chief executive officer. The highest ranking employee within any organization usually, simply put, the philosophy means this. You cannot overpay a good CEO and you cannot underpay a bad one. But who decides this pay? What justifies it? And how much is too much pay? We ask because Elon Musk He's in the news again, this time over his pay. Musk is the CEO of Tesla Motors. He took the position in 2018. Guess how much he was paid for it? A record-breaking $55.8 billion. I'll repeat that for you. Nearly $56 billion per year. It is jaw-dropping. And if you can drop any further, let me tell our Indian viewers, it is over 46 karabs in Indian rupees. That's 46 plus 11 zeros. Elon Musk's compensation was the largest corporate pay deal ever. In 2022, the package was six times larger than the combined pay of the 200 highest paid executives in 2021. But don't let this dampen the joy of your payday. Just as Tesla agreed to pay Musk $56 billion, a shareholder filed a lawsuit against Musk and Tesla. His name is Richard Tornetta. He claimed that the pay was excessive and he blamed Tesla's board for it. According to Tornetta, the board decided the pay, but they did not act independently. Musk improperly dictated negotiations. The case went to court in Delaware. After five years, the judgment is finally here. The judge has tossed out Musk's pay package, calling it, and I'm quoting, an unfathomable sum. So what happens next? Musk may appeal the ruling, or Tesla's board may have to come up with a new proposal for him. Musk is currently the richest person in the world. This could drop him down to number three. Shocking, I know. This is affecting Tesla too. Hours after the ruling, its shares fell by 3%. But most of all, this ruling is being seen as a warning, not just to Tesla, but to companies everywhere in the world that award their executives exorbitant sums. And stop me if you've heard this one before, but CEOs are unbelievably well compensated. 
High sky CEOP is no secret, and it keeps rising further into the stratosphere, sometimes even when CEOs do not even take up positions. Like in September 2022, Lakshman Narasimhan was hired as the new Starbucks CEO. He was set to take to make about $18 million a year. But even if he did not join by next April, he would still be making $8 million. So what justifies the fat paychecks of these big cats? CEOs are key to success. For starters, they create wealth for the shareholders, which is their primary goal. Top bosses are visionary leaders, or expected to be. Their decisions affect every employee and customer. They have to take big risks and they must reap big rewards, which is what apparently explains the gulf between a CEO's paycheck and their typical employees. But how vast can this gulf be? Let me show you some numbers. This is the ratio of CEO pay to a typical worker's pay. In the 1960s, it stood at 20 to 1. So if the CEO is making $20, an average worker is making 1. By 2019, this gap rose to 300 to 1. And with every passing year, it gets worse. In America, the average pay gap is 670 to 1. But remember, that's the average. At Walmart, for instance, the pay ratio is 983 to 1. At Coca-Cola, it is 1,621 to 1. At Amazon, it is 6,474 to 1. In 2019, Disney CEO Bob Iger got a pay package of $66 million. It was more than 1,000 times the median pay of Disney employees. This is staggering. But most nations have a similar story. In India, the top paid executives receive annual pay of about a million dollars on average. An average worker earns $12,000. In the UK, CEOs make $5 million. For the average worker, it is about $40,000. In South Africa, CEOs earn $800,000. Workers make $1,600. Studies say you'd have to work five lifetimes to make what your boss makes in one year. And this rarely changes, even when crisis strikes. During the first year of the pandemic, CEO pay jumped 19%, even as many businesses ground to a halt. So while it is true that CEOs bring massive value to a company, at some point, this pay disparity appears fundamentally unfair. Studies show that it also builds resentment. It can be demoralizing. It can lead to employee backlash which comes out in ugly ways. Lower paid employees shrug off responsibilities or leave their jobs or go on strikes. Recently, we saw all of this with the Hollywood writer's strike and the Detroit auto workers' protests. Because people make a lot of work decisions based on pay. Not just what they are being paid, but also what others around them are. It affects a lot of people. Plus, does it even help CEOs all that much? These high pay packages. Studies say not really. Increasing CEO pay is not linked to increasing CEO productivity. So a CEO salary should not be an extreme sport because it can be just as bad for optics as it is for business. Our next story comes from America, where a few months ago, parents of 60 teenagers filed a lawsuit. Their children allegedly bought drugs via social media on apps like Facebook and Snapchat. Some of these drugs were fentanyl-laced pills. The teens overdosed, and some of them died. So yesterday, a fiery hearing was held in the U.S. Senate, and drugs were not the only issue at hand. It was also about harmful messaging, online bullying, harassment, sexual exploitation, self-harm, and predatory marketing. The seven plagues of social media. CEOs of five tech giants were present. They were questioned for almost four hours. The senators battered them. They accused the companies of failing to protect children on their platforms. Yeah, and quote, unquote, having blood on their hands. But most of all, these two top bosses got the worst of their ire. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg and Snapchat CEO Evan Spiegel. 
37% of teenage girls between 13 and 15 were exposed to unwanted nudity in a week on Instagram. You knew about it. Who did you fire? Senator, this is why we're building all Who these did you fire? tools. Senator, that's, I don't think that that's... Who did you fire? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to answer that. Because um, <laughs> I mean, you didn't is, fire anybody, right? You didn't take Senator, any significant I, I action. It's appropriate to talk about it, it, like it's not appropriate. decisions. In, in Do you know who's like sitting that. behind you? Senator, our job and what we take seriously is making sure that we build industry-leading tools, find harmful to content, make money. take it off the services. Have you apologized to the victims? I... Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I, I, I'm sorry for everything that you've all done. It's terrible and no one should have to go through the things that your families have, have suffered. And this is why we invested so much and are going to continue doing industry leading efforts to, uh, to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things that your families have had to suffer. Tech giants are like the British monarchy. They acknowledge the loot and the slavery, but they refuse to apologize for it. And they fail to make amends. So Mark Zuckerberg's apology has gone viral, even if he was guilt-tripped into it. It was a grand gesture, great for the pictures. But what came out of this hearing? Nothing constructive. The big cats were grilled. Most of their answers were defensive. They were asked about the, the steps to protect children online, and their answers were lukewarm. The Kids Online Safety Act was discussed. This is a proposed law in America, the Kids Online Safety Act. It requires social media sites to prevent harm to minors. Three out of five CEOs did not pledge their support to it. Did the top bosses of these mammoth tech giants even want to attend the hearing? Not particularly. Three out of five were sent government-issued subpoenas. They were practically dragged to this hearing. It's a sad state of affairs, but it's not shocking. The Congress has held dozens of such hearings. But children's online safety has stagnated. At this point, everyone knows the problem. Not just parents and teachers, but policymakers as well. They know that there is a problem. This month, the New York City mayor classified social media as a public health hazard. He called it an environmental toxin. And he's not being extra. Look at these numbers. Child sex images are more widely available than ever. The content on online platforms grew from 32 million in 2022 to over 36 million last year. 36 million pornographic images of children. In fact, last year, New Mexico's Attorney General sued Meta. He called it the world's single largest marketplace for pedophiles. On top of this, social media is fueling a mental health crisis. 46% adolescents say that social media makes them feel worse about their body image. 64% are often exposed to hate-based content. This is concerning beyond measure, and the inability to take action over it is just as frustrating. Sure, tech giants are at fault, but demanding that they do better is an argument in bad faith. Big tech is like big tobacco or the alcohol or gambling industry, why would they set up guardrails for themselves? Their financial interest lies in keeping users on their platforms. 99% of Snapchat revenue comes from displaying ads to users. The figure for Meta is 98%. Screen time is their revenue stream. So kids suffer and social media profits, which is why the burden, the onus, is on governments. They have to acknowledge negative impacts of social media, create policies to regulate these companies and make sure that children are protected. They have to ensure that tech giants sell their products in a way that protects vulnerable users. And this is exactly what public regulation is for. Our governments need to do better. So Mark Zuckerberg may have apologized, but this is not a hooray moment. The apology is not enough, far from it. We need laws, we need action, we need protection. Our last story tonight is about a superpower. All of us possess it. 
but we rarely use it. I'm talking about the power of power naps. For years, napping was seen as a sign of laziness. We say things like caught napping or found asleep at the switch. But lately, nap time has gathered newfound respect. New scientific evidence proves that napping is powerful juice. Now, the academics may get a lot of told you so's, for starters, from nesting penguins who nap over 10,000 times a day, or babies who can nap at least thrice a day, or even cultures where afternoon naps are a daily ritual, like in the states of West Bengal and Goa in India, their afternoon naps are sacrosanct. The Spanish are renowned for their daily siesta. Japanese workers also enjoy what they called hirune, or afternoon naps. But maybe their side-eye will be well-deserved because some shut-eye can do wonders. Regular naps are good for our long-term health. Naps lasting just 15 minutes can help our body repair. They help regrow tissues, build muscles, and strengthen the immune system. But more than this, naps are great for our brains. They keep our brains bigger for longer. Let me explain why that's important. Think of your brain as a fruit. As you age, the brain will shrink in size. So the brain volume will decrease. And this has been linked to a wide range of diseases. It's a major reason why older people are more prone to ailments. People with smaller brains are more likely to have higher levels of stress. Also, high risks of cardiovascular diseases and dementia. Naps help us process new information, consolidate our memory. They give our brains much needed rest. Naps lasting just 5 to 15 minutes immediately improve how we perform mentally. Their effects can last up to three hours. And regular naps over the week can delay brain aging by three to six years, thus keeping our brains bigger. Now, this is probably why tech giants like Google, Samsung, and Meta have nap pods in their offices. Why truck drivers and hospital interns have a culture of napping. It helps them maintain alertness. Or why many schools incorporate nap time for children. I'm no mind reader, but at this point you may be thinking that naps don't work for everyone. Maybe they don't leave you feeling refreshed. You just end up feeling more tired. Sometimes you wake up after a power nap and don't know which planet you're on or what year it is. In that case, let me tell you this. When it comes to power naps, timing is key, like when you nap and for how long you nap. Power naps should not go for longer than 20 minutes. And they yield maximum benefits when you nap in the afternoon, that is between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. That's when naps boost physical and mental performance the most. But if you frequently need daytime naps, it can be a cause of, for concern. It can be a sign that you aren't getting sufficient sleep because naps are no substitutes for a good night's sleep. They're just additional bonus. So it is not just important to get into the habit of naps, but to do it right. As they say, sleep is nature's medicine. So when it comes to power naps, the goal is to treat it as such. Use it in small doses at the right time to reap the benefits. And as the day goes, regain your momentum, not by reaching for that third latte, but by embracing your catnap, because the real fiesta, they say, can lie in some siesta. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America.